Hello and welcome to the BizNews News Wrap, our daily summary of the top stories from BizNews. It's Monday the 28th of October. I'm Lucy Ferreira. We have a jam-packed show today covering both local and global politics and finance. First up with the Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture, Gayton McKenzie, sharing his views on the controversial South African rugby union equity deal. After that, campaign manager McCorne Maja from the Institute for Race Relations discusses the political competition within the ANC, potential successes to Ramaphosa and the recent performance of the DA and PA in by-elections. Legal expert Christopher Cardero then joins us, who represents the civil rights organization Pestalozzi Trust, addressing the latest legal challenges against the Bela Bill. And then, veteran financial maverick David Shapiro offers his insights on the upcoming U.S. elections and their implications for South Africa and the world. And lastly, our partners at Bloomberg share a positive outlook for the tech sector. Before we dive in, remember that these clips are just teasers of the in-depth discussions featured on the full interviews on biznews.com. You can find the complete interviews on Biznews TV and radio, or for real-time insights, join Alec Hogg for the Biznews briefing streamed live at 7 a.m. on weekdays. And if you miss it, don't worry, it will be available on our platforms later in the day. Starting off this afternoon with Gate and McKenzie discussing the Springbok rugby equity deal, stressing the need for constructive dialogue and the importance of foreign investment in rugby. In the full interview with Chris Stain on Biz News, Gaten elaborates on the risks posed by infighting within the GNU and the potential rise of Jacob Zuma's MK party. Gaten, I just want to go to your portfolio quickly. Can you tell us what is happening with the rugby equity deal? As far as the equity deal is concerned, you know, there's a lot of emotion going around. People are unhappy. There's a lot of speculation. Most of the things that's in the public arena, it's not really the truth. For instance, where people are saying uh, they're selling the spring box. That's not entirely true. But there's some things that I myself would like to see change in that deal after reading through it. And um, the provincial union bosses called me and they told me, help us, minister. I said, fine. I then met with Saru. I said, stop uh, the thing. It's not an instruction, it's an ask. Because I can't really interfere in rugby and football because the world governing bodies don't allow government interference. So I can only try to persuade. So I persuaded them. The president of SARU, Mark Alexander, and CEO Rian Oberosa then agreed. They will postpone the vote. Next week I'm meeting with all the bosses of the different units. But I want to say two things. Number one, you know, we must not act like people are falling over their feet to invest in rugby. Rugby is not buying gold bars. Uh, uh, so when we have foreign direct investment, when we differ with them, we should do it respectfully and not calling them criminals, people that want to put money in. And, you know, the people like Rob Hershoff and everybody that complains about the deal, let me see their deal. Put the deal on the table, that's better. You know, business is business. You can't just come and say, this deal is rubbish. So as a deal that's not rubbish. And that's just a fact. If there's only, if you go to an auction house, and then, then you take, let's for instance, you take this uh, iPad and there's only one and they auction this. And only one person says, I pay 10 rents for, for the thing. You can't say the auctioneer is corrupt. You need to have other bits. So that's what I'm going to strive to achieve. And say, show us, a, give us a better, put something better on the table. Rugby needs the money. Rugby is uh, basically uh, bankrupt. Well, not only Saru, but all federations around the world. So I'm just wanting to be the voice that says to people, let's sit down, let's hear each other. Let, let, today is one year exactly since we won the Rugby World Cup. One year exactly. 
we're starting a honeymoon phase of that. Let's not muddy the waters with accusations and count accusations. Let's come together and let's say, there's a better deal. Saru would be out of their minds if there's a better deal on the table. The Eccle brothers have shown uh, a commitment in our country and say we are willing to invest money. No, you don't just say to people, yeah, we don't want your deal without saying there's something else. What will happen if they withdraw and there's no deal on the table? So I challenge all the billionaires, all the people that love rugby, come give us, show us how rubbish this deal is of the Eccle brothers. And let's not just call people corrupt and the names and, uh, and no, you can't get so much commission. That's a commission is irrelevant. You can get 1% commission, you can get 20% commission. I've done deals where I've got 25% commission. I've got deals where I've got half a percent commission. It all depends on the deal and the structuring and your negotiating skills. You don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. So next week, I'll come back on your show to give you a report on how my meeting went with her. But I want to thank Saru for listening to me when I asked them, because I didn't demand, I asked for the meeting, the vote to be postponed. And they adhered to my ask, and I want to thank them for that. Next, Makone Maja analyzes emerging ANC figures positioning themselves as potential successors to Ramaphosa, with Masha Tele and Lusufi particularly vocal. Maja also addresses recent by-election results, noting the DA's strong performance, the, patriot the Patriotic Alliance's significant win, and the EFF's unusual absence, indicating possible internal challenges. In the full interview, Maja and Alec unpack critical topics, including concerns of unrest in Mozambique and the youth's perspectives on Russia and ANC allegiances as well as South Africa's strategic non-alignment and investment opportunities. For Masha Thiele, uh, he has over the weekend in the Sunday Times saying mm, he's ready if they want to make him president. He's, uh, he's quite keen to do that. And yet there's a lot of controversy around him uh, from many different quarters. What's your reading of this? Yeah, this question has been coming up quite a lot in the media where uh, high-ranking ANC officials uh, being asked about um, whether they would throw their hats in the ring. Um, I will say the NEC, the next electoral conference in the in, in, for the ANC, is still some years away. And as I indicated, the president, Ramaphosa, is still the most liked and favored president. So I'm sure they'll be keeping him, um, dare I say, full term. Um, Jose and Sorama Hobao has also recently asked on a different podcast uh, whether he would throw his hand up to be president of the organization. And he said, absolutely, he said he would not shy away um, from raising his hand. And so I think we're seeing a lot of that um, ANC officials positioning themselves or conditioning us to begin viewing them as potential successors to Mr. Ramaphosa. Um, there were also allegations when there was some tension between Mr. Lusufi and Mr. Secretary General of the NC in Balula, when Balula was trying to rein in Mr. Lusufi and and um, discipline him for not walking in lockstep with some of the NEC's positions on different things, specifically coalitions with the, the DA, that was also seen as the two of those leaders, you know, showing their different power within the organization, but also very much conditioning us. Um, to start seeing them as potential leaders of the ANC. So I think Mashadile joined that list of candidates in the ANC who are obviously cognizant of the fact that this is Mr. Ramaphosa's last term and that, yeah, they, they want their members and the rest of the branches, as Mr. Mashadile say, to start ruminating on that question of who's to come next. You didn't mention Ronald Lamola. Yeah, Ronald doesn't um, have the the sort of position in government that I think gives him the opportunity to present his leadership as much. He's been quite quite silent actually since the formation of the the GNU, but he's definitely a contender. I think he was liked by branches in Limpopo. Um, so I do think a lot of the competition will be coming from from Gauteng because that's where those leaders that I mentioned, be it Mr. Ramaphosa or uh, Mashatilo, even Mr. Lusufi, uh, emerge. 
But I, I, I do think in the northern northern province of Limpopo, uh, Lamola is definitely a force to be reckoned with. And to close off with, there were by-elections last week. The DA retained five seats, and the PA, Gaden McKenzie's party, won a seat from the good party. Now, the PA hasn't won many seats since the November 2021 election, so to, to win a ward is, is quite a big deal there, yet not much, not much comment. What's, what's your thinking? Is Gaten actually, is the PA generally making a strides? There has been criticism of Gaten McKenzie that whilst he's embracing his new role within the GNU, he has neglected um, his duties in his party with respect to growing that party. Um, and so I think this kind of pours up some cold water on that because it's good progress for the Patriotic Alliance. Uh, another one to take note of, which is an observation by Marius Ruiz, one of my colleagues, is that the EFF was a no-show in all of these by-elections, from the ones in the Western Cape to the ones in Umalanga um, to the one that took place in Tuane. And so that's very unlike, very much unlike the EFF because not even having the faintest of chances in winning a by-election has never stopped them before from running, and yet they were a no-show. So that's definitely indicative of some of the issues or battles within EFF leadership at present. Another one that um, I would point our audience to is that Cape Exit got 13.41% in one of those by-elections in Cape Town. So there seems to be momentum for the Cape Independence Group uh, within the, the Western Cape, although not much, but surprisingly, a 13% to me sounds like quite much. Um, but yeah, the DA retained those those five seats, so it still um, dominates the Western Cape, uh, and including its increase in, in, in road share in Emalasheni, where it grew by 20 percentage points. I believe in the last by-election, they got in the late 60 percent, and now they got 80 percent. So they are growing in, in that region. And now we hear from Christopher Cordero on the need for comprehensive education reform in South Africa. He critiques the bailable as a technocratic measure that fails to address the evolving needs of students and educational practices. Well, you know, and that's, and this is one of the real, and and this is the kind of other problem with the bill, which is that Bellable essentially is a technocratic bill. It's a bill, and the, and the department's very honest. It has been honest about it. They've said throughout, they've said, this is a technical bill. It's, it's not going to address all the sort of things you're worried about. It's really a bill for the administrators. Um, and, and that's a huge flaw. So, so, so the first thing is we need a child-centric bill. Um, you know, we've, had, we've got some very strong world, globe, worldwide leading child-centric legislation both in the Children's Act and in the Child Justice Act. Neither of those were properly incorporated into the Bella Bill. You know, so, so those came after 1996 and the advent of the bill, um, of, of the school's bill. But they were never incorporated. So, the, so our education law was never rewritten, taking those fundamental pillars into account. That's flaw kind of one. Flaw two is that... Um, the twin of the bill, so when SASA, South African Schools Act, came into force, the twin of this of 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 Bella Act was then the um, was then the, the the National Education Policy Act, and that that act also came into force, and that act wasn't reformed um, at at the time. Uh, it wasn't reformed now in this, this recent process. So we kind of have got we've got one leg, but we don't have the other leg, um, and then so those are the two key kind of. So we need. We need radical policy reform, and that came up in the hearings on the Bella Bill, and which now the Bella Act. People were saying we need to have provision for online schooling. We need to look at all of these new developments since COVID. We need to update. We need to meet all of the other needs. So we need a a wide-scale reform of our education policy, and then we need that enacted into law. Um, And I I was just recently, uh, I was just recently in India attending the uh, the. the inaugural meeting of the Indian Association of Education Law and Policy, they have developed, they developed as, late, as far back as 20, uh, uh, 2020, a complete a new education policy for India. 
Um, and I think we can see why India is doing so well in its economy. Um, and 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 they were and they at that stage already were looking at AI, we're looking at online, we're looking at language policy, all the aspects of the policy that all aspects of policy that are concerned. They they passed this large consolidated new education policy, and that's what we need and what we don't have. And and I think I would hope that the minister would kind of go beyond this kind of technocratic. Um, controversial technocratic bill and actually take a wide look at, at the kind of education reform we need and the reform we need to our education infrastructure, uh, our education, our, our legal education infrastructure, or the infrastructure of our education law, and, and really sort of rebuild the house. Because if we don't, we're, we're certainly behind. We're certainly behind globally. We're even behind in Africa in certain aspects. So there's a huge need to to reform the whole of our education law. Next, Sassman's David Shapiro shares his macro views on the upcoming U.S. elections and how the results may impact South Africa. <laughs> You've you got to laugh at Donald Trump. I mean, he's rolling out celebrities now. Elon Musk, oh, he'll take $2 trillion out of the American budget. <laughs> like, mm, okay, yeah. uh, problem solved. Wow. <laughs> do you want what do you Elon make Musk of all, as your advisor? <laughs> sure. You know, it's, just, I, it's it's going to be. Mm. You got Beyonce and Taylor Swift versus Hulk Hogan and Elon Musk. You know that's the lineup. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I mean, we, you know what the worry is? I don't. It's whether or not there's a clean sweep by the Republicans. That's where you need that uh, circuit breaker. So, uh, one of the houses has got to go to the uh, Democrats. You know, either the House exp- or the Senate. Because Explain that. Go bad. Explain that. Yeah. Explain in, that. In, in other words, a, what do you mean by a clean sweep? Uh, it means that the the Republicans control the presidency, the Senate, and the House, the Congress. You know, in other words, a whole system. Uh, he can push through whatever he wants to. You know, you can get fringe people like uh, Must having an influence. So at the moment, the call is. Uh, yeah, I think Trump is just slightly ahead, as much as. We don't want that to happen, but I think there might be a chance that the Democrats take the House again, which is the the lower house, you know, where which is very important in in terms of determining uh, policy. So that's the concern, you know. It's not only the presidency; it's uh, the three different elections, you know. And always every every four years, half the uh, oh, sorry, every two years, half the Senate is elected and half the members of Cong- of of the House are elected. So. So that's the so that's the concern. As, uh? us here in South Africa as outsiders, uh, we yep. should be hoping that one side or the other don't get get the presidency plus the two that's, houses of government, as it were, so that at least there's some kind of a balance on the worst uh, impulses of a right. of a gent like uh, Donald Trump. Uh, I was listening to Wesley Clark, funny enough, on Bloomberg this morning, being interviewed. And he was, he's a former general, very, very high up. I think he was the NATO general there. And he says that, you know, uh, Trump is a security risk. He says he's a national security risk. He says he takes advice from the last person who gave it to him. So I think, I think most people are very concerned about what a Trump presidency can mean. You know, you mentioned the relationship, I mean, even with Putin, where where you mentioned Putin, I mean the relationship with Putin, and Putin will love it, according to Clark. He says because uh, if there's conflict between China and America, <laughs> you know it suits Putin. He's in the middle, benefiting from both, you know, from both sides. So anyway, an interesting development there, David, is that China has been reaching out to America's allies, uh, almost yeah. signalling that if Trump wins, they would um, have to look for other. Uh, markets and so they've been talking a lot to the eu to the british to japan even uh, where there has been quite a lot of history between them and it's it's all geopolitics why are we why you and i who talk markets have been talking markets for decades why are we actually paying so much attention to this it will be over in two weeks it won't you know you know i mean it's just that it's uh headlines at the moment but I think what we found in the past is a week passes, we get used to the result, and we move on. And I don't think that uh, the people at the lab at Microsoft or the people at the lab at NVIDIA give a damn or give a hoot. They just carry on doing what they do. 
and America just kind of rolls on. I think the worry is whether he can push through Trump, should he be in these ridiculous tariffs. I mean, I don't think he's thought them through and what that will mean. You know, tax cuts, additional tariffs. Um, that's why you're finding volatility in the market as, at, at, at the moment. And that's why you're finding volatility in the bond market because his policies are highly inflationary. You know, tariffs affect everybody. Yes, we're going to gonna increase tariffs so people build factories, you know, in America. How long does it take to build a factory? And how long does it play in a factory? You, know, you can't just overnight say, oh, let's build a factory so that we avoid tariffs. You know, it's crazy. And America hasn't got the capacity to fulfill um, what they do import, although they're not a massive importing nation. So I think everything's distorted. And uh, if he does reduce taxes to the levels that he does, of course, that's inflation. You know, it's, uh, they not, oh, sorry, it certainly increases American debt because you're not receiving the tax uh, um, you know, revenues. Lastly, our partners at Bloomberg feature Thomas A. Martin, Senior Portfolio Manager at Global Tea Investments, discussing his optimism for the upcoming tech earnings this season. Let's just talk a little bit about Apple and as it sits in the context of the Magnificent Seven. Just as we look towards next week and we start to get this bumper crop of earnings, you feeling optimistic? Um, well, I, we are feeling optimistic. Uh, I mean, these are companies that are uh, growing their earnings and their revenues, uh, and they have had a little bit of a, um, you know, I guess not slowdown, but uh, they, they haven't been as strong as they were in the first half of the year. Uh, and the fundamentals underlying them uh, in terms of driving their revenues and their earnings are still pretty strong. So uh, we're hopeful that we can get some good reports out of them. So that is very interesting, Thomas. I will, if you allow me to, do a bit of scene setting. I think we agree that the MAG7 were the big driver of the S&P 500 in the first half of this year. But that's kind of changed since July, right? When that index, if you call it an index, peaked. And if you take the basket of the MAG7 or the five that will report next, I think the earnings growth expectation is about 19%, sub 20%, way beyond the S&P 500. But... It's also the slowest rate of EPS growth for like six quarters. So how optimistic are you? Give us a sort of relative frame of reference. Well, I think that's a good point. Uh, and I think that applies also to the market in general, uh, is that we did have a big run up to a new high and we're, we're, we're back above uh, the, that high um, again. I mean, we're off it a little bit now from the all time high, but here we are, and this, the seasonality of the market has really been brought forward in, in every case. And so we were supposed to maybe have some weakness here in September and October. October's almost over, and we really haven't seen that. And we're supposed to have a rally into the end of the year uh, from right. that, that weakened point, and we may not get that. Uh, it, it may have been kind of pulled through. And so one reason to not be as optimistic is, uh, regardless of what the results are, is that the market says, you know, we just uh, we need to take a little breather here um, for these companies that are up so strongly. I mean, 27 percent on the uh, Russell 1000 growth and uh, um, uh, the uh, MGK, you know, the, the large cap mega growth. And that's a wrap for today's news wrap. You can find all of these interviews and articles on business.com TV and radio. And don't forget to join Alec Hogg's business briefing streaming live tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. You can find the link on the Biz News homepage or in Alec Hogg's daily newsletter. Thanks for joining us.